One man who's been vocal on this side of the channel uh, in his criticism of the government's approach is Jonathan Sumption. He's a former Supreme Court judge. He joins us now. Uh, Jonathan Sumption, welcome to Spectator TV. Morning. Um, do you not have any sympathy with the government on its slow approach to coming out of the lockdown, which you could defend as a, a better safe than sorry approach? Well, the government's position throughout, right from last March, has been that it will not discriminate uh, between people according to their different levels of vulnerability. So uh, it has locked down healthy people uh, and young people who are at very small risk of getting seriously ill, let alone dying. And it has adhered to that throughout. What we are seeing now is that an even bigger anomaly about this approach, because with uh, more than a third of the population vaccinated, including a very high proportion of all the most vulnerable people, they are still saying that everybody has got to be treated in exactly the same way, whether they are vulnerable to this disease or not. Uh, I think we are now reaching the stage when people are going to start losing patience with this. It's clear that there is a third wave about. We see that most of all in continental Europe. Because their vaccine rollout has been slow, it's going to hit them worse, hit Britain less because of the success so far of our vaccine program. In the circumstances we now find ourselves in, what would you like the government to do going forward into uh, spring and early summer? I think that they should now recognise that it is a lot more efficient and effective for each of us to make our own risk assessments because our positions are too different to allow for anything else. Some of us have had the disease but already, uh, some of us have been vaccinated, some of us are young, some old, some healthy, some not. A one-size-fits-all approach is no longer a defensible way of approaching this. We have got to make a risk assessment for ourselves and those immediately around us. What would happen if that then led to a huge spike in cases and deaths? I think uh, that it's unlikely to lead to a huge spike. Uh, I would certainly accept that it might lead to a small one, but we have to be prepared to take risks because of the enormous collateral costs. If, even if you simply confine yourself to the position of the, of, of the health sector, we are looking uh, at a significant increase uh, in diseases like dementia and cancer, which are also killers, but actually this isn't just a public health issue. It's an economic issue, it's a moral issue, it's an educational issue, it's a social issue. We've got to face the fact uh, that it may be worth putting up uh, with a modest increase in the death toll uh, in order to be able to have uh, an economy that functions, an educational system that functions. We simply have to accept that no country ever saved lives by making itself poorer. The government, though, is very influenced, I would suggest, by what happened last summer and into early autumn. Uh, if by last summer, we thought things were going to open out and we had that eat out scheme where you were subsidized to go to the local restaurant. Things seemed to be beginning to get back to normal. The economy was beginning to pick up too. And then suddenly cases started to rise again and deaths started to rise again. And the government delayed bringing in more lockdown. Uh, procedures then, and it's being accused now as a result of that, increasing deaths because it was so slow to act, to move in to further lockdown. Uh, isn't that, isn't it right that the government should take notice of its previous experience when it didn't go so well? Of course, but we have to look rather carefully at what its previous experience was. Right from the outset, indeed in the notorious Imperial College statistical projection produced in the middle of March last year, the government was told that lockdowns only work if they are kept in place permanently until there's a vaccine. So actually the government had a choice. It could say at last March, we will now have a vaccine, a lockdown uh, that will last for as long as it takes to get the vaccine uh, or it might as well forget the lockdown altogether. Because the reality is, as the Imperial College study quite clearly showed, 
is that if you have a lockdown and then lift it, what happens is that the lives that you saved uh, during the lockdown, the deaths are simply shunted into a later period. Now, uh, I doubt whether the British people, even in their relatively submissive mood of last year, would have tolerated the government saying, we are going to lock you all down for what may be anything up to 18 months or at least a year. But that was the choice that they had. The reality is that uh, if more people who were young and healthy had got the disease during the summer, uh, when they were most unlikely, these are categories that are most unlikely to become seriously ill or die, many more of them would have had a natural immunity at the time when the more virulent strains came in during the autumn. I don't think it's at all clear uh, that this policy uh, worked uh, uh, when the lockdown was in force. I don't think it's at all clear that if the lockdown had been kept permanently in place, uh, uh, it would have been complied with. The fact is, a lockdown can work if it is one total and two indefinite in duration and that would have done even more catastrophic damage to our educational sector and our economy and to the health of people in respect of other diseases than what we've ever suffered anyway. And yet the British government is not alone in not following your advice when it comes uh, to lockdown. Almost every major government uh, in the democratic world has been forced into uh, uh, lockdowns, various forms of them. Uh, politicians, governments of very different, different political uh, hues, whether it's That's Governor that. Cuomo in New York or Isn't President it? Macron yeah. in France or Chancellor Merkel in Germany or whoever uh, was Prime Minister back then. I can't remember who then. It's now Mr. Draghi, but back then, whoever was Prime Minister in Italy, they had to do lockdowns too, particularly in the north. Uh, I mean, it, it, there has to be something to the argument that if all these governments saw that was the right way, there has to be something in that. Only if they were making an independent judgment. In fact, what was happening uh, is that they were all copying each other because they were afraid that their own populations would say, oh, look, in the country next door they're doing this. Why aren't you doing something similar? The fact is that before the lockdowns were ordered, all governments that had done serious studies about this, including our own, uh, had a policy based on serious scientific advice that they would not lock people down. You can take our example, for example, and I'll mention Germany in a moment. Uh, in this country, we had been planning for an event exactly like this for more than 10 years. Uh, it was top of the National Risk Register, in 2011, a detailed plan, which was kept regularly up to date, was prepared as to how to deal with it. And the basic principles behind that plan were, first of all, uh, that you did not use coercion. You used advice uh, 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 to the population, uh, but you allowed them to make their own risk assessments. And secondly, that you did not uh, isolate uh, or take abrasive measures against the healthy. You concentrated uh, on isolating the infectious and the sick. Now, strikingly enough, exactly the same principles lay behind the German National Pandemic Plan, which was drawn up by the Robert Koch Institute, which is a highly respected body. They all, uh, the, those that have published plans, worked along exactly the same lines, and the World Health Organization also recommended exactly that approach. So what we have here is governments independently forming the view that they should take a less abrasive attitude to major pandemics uh, and then all copying each other and throwing out the window 10 years worth of careful scientific and administrative planning. That does not do credit to any of these governments. They basically jettisoned their own research. Now, I've heard it said that nobody expected uh, that there would be any pandemic, anything like as serious as this. I'm afraid that is simply untrue. Uh, the uh, 2017 edition of the National Risk Register in this country envisaged that a new pathogen uh, might cause deaths up to 750,000. Not even Professor Ferguson has suggested that the deaths uh, would have been anything like that on any of the various hypotheses. So what we have actually done is to reject the scientific approach to adopt 
a policy that fails to discriminate between different degrees of vulnerability, and that is scientifically disreputable. Uh, the reason why this is happening is the fear of populations across Europe uh, and their belief that if their governments are not doing something abrasive and hyperactive about it, they are going to sleep on the job. That's never been true. They, they had very careful plans and they should have adhered to them. Final question for you. Do you see a link, as some do, a link between a government that has now presided over a variety of lockdowns for a year now and this new policing bill, uh, which would seem to, in various ways, crib and confine our ability to protest and demonstrate peacefully? Um, I don't see much of a link. Uh, I think there's a, a good deal of uh, uh, of uh, press reporting to suggest, and it sounds plausible, that the Home Secretary was much exercised by protests against the lockdown. And to, if that is true, then it may well be that there is a link. But actually, the issues raised uh, in the current bill have been around for a long time. Parts of the bill are perfectly acceptable, in my view, and parts of it are not. The bits that aren't acceptable are the bits that give an altogether excessive discretion to both the police and the Home Secretary. We ought not to have laws that are defined entirely by the Home Secretary, who is now under this bill, it's proposed to give her powers to say, to say what constitutes sufficient disruption to constitute a criminal offence. We ought not to allow policemen on the hoof to decide which protests they will curtail and which they will not. On the other hand, other parts of the bill are perfectly respectable because it seems to me that a person's right to protest stops short uh, at the point when they have to trample on other people's rights to go about their ordinary business. Uh, and the creation of a, a, a public nuisance offence seems to me to be a desirable and healthy step. Jonathan Sumption, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Pleasure. Pleasure.